Generation Z on two, two parts in my life. Uh, one is as a researcher, I've been doing that for 20 years. Um, the other part is uh, as a parent. I have three Gen Zers at home. And we're going through times that are putting particularly a little bit more requirements on parents, um, as I think many parents have noticed these last, you know, this time we're in. So I have had to kind of disconnect myself from my my uh, research self and, uh, you know, connect myself more into my motherly self, which only means that uh, the, the deficit that I might have in my presentation, I can at least promise you guys that I'm living, uh, my, I'm living my talk as, um, as we speak. So anyway, um, let's get started and I'm, Oh yeah, I have to share my screen. I there's so many different platforms. <laughs> uh, okay, so we just went through this, so I should be able to do it. And then, of course, I'm not uh, share content. Okay, so okay, all right, here we go. So um, I called my talk from Boomer to Zoomers, Generation Z, Digital Native, and Communicating in Our Post-COVID Future. Um, I, I would be lying to you guys if I said that I had a whole lot of, uh, that I've been able to do a ton of research as to how much COVID has changed or, or amplified anything at this point. I think it's too early to say that we have a lot of data. We really don't. So some of this is going to be a little bit of speculation and it's going to be a little bit of a hindsight view, like to kind of create the, uh, the, the historical context of where we are. Um, so, you know, it might be pertinent to ask, what would you even study generations during a time of a crisis? I mean, isn't it too much going on? Like, why would we even have that focus? And isn't it um, possibly just reinforcing stereotypes? Um, and I, I, I tend to differ there because I think that it's through understanding what, what makes people different or what tends to make, make people different and what tends to give people things in common. That's how we foster conversation. It's not to pretend that differences don't exist. It's rather to highlight it and, or look at it and, and, and kind of, uh, unpack it and see what might be there. So I'm very fascinated by doing this. And another reason that I find generational uh, theories particularly interesting as a subfield of various uh, sociology or, or different parts of social science is pr it's the only variable, only demographic variable, if you can call it a demographic variable, that, that deals with time, where time is the independent variable. So, uh, you know, we're, we're used to looking at you know, how are people similar, different, or how do we segment people based on all sorts of other variables? But what this is the only um, this is the only segmentation tool that we have that deals with time as a as as, as a as a factor. And what's interesting about that is that you really look at these various people, these different cohorts, if you will, against a constantly moving target. So um, it, it's, it's time when time is the influence on how you turn out as a, as a person or, or to the effect that that has an effect on you and how your personality is. Uh, it is because history obviously moves in, 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 in certain ways. Uh, we can think of, you know, Shakespeare's uh, Seven Stages of Man, where we're all players in this big play called life and you go through these seven stages well what what he did mention is that you know it, it's not only what age you're in that determines your what you think and what you do but it's also the when when you're going through a particular life phase and what is happening in society at that particular time so what is very typical is that we we tend to we can we can see history or the time we can see it as cycles or s shapes where we can recognize that there are a lot of macro historical or macro social 
trends that, that seem to ebb and flow, seem to undulate in this almost predictable patterns. And I know that that can sound a little bit like gobbledygook to some people. I, I'm a big fan of a theory, a generational theory called uh, the theory of Strauss and Howe, um, where who were uh, two historians who wrote two sort of seminal books on generational theory, where they found that that there tends to be some repetitive traits that that come around like every eighty years. So uh, each generation tends to. And it's the, the thing about it is that it is actually supported with data. And that's what's so interesting about it is that if you look at many different sort of long term trends, so whether you look at demographic cycles or economic cycles or in political cycles, you see a lot of things repeat itself or at least rhyme. Uh, to, to quote uh, Mark Twain, um, in most uh, post-agrarian and post-industrial societies, we see demographic cycles undulate how much the cohort in um, childbearing age is. Uh, boomers obviously gave birth to a, a fairly large generation of millennials. But there are other factors that play in here too, like for example, economic cycles. So you can see that very often um, when, when the economy is, is bad or if, it, if we, we feel like there's some insecurity in the economy, we will see that the, grow, uh, the birth rate goes down. And, and what I think is particularly interesting these, uh, these days uh, is that uh, political polarization in this case is operationalized as um, bills in, in, in Congress to which extent the, the different parties are voting on the same bills or agree on the same bills. Um, that tends to be cyclical as well. And this, this um, graph here in the middle only goes to 2009, I believe. So those, that polarity is really, really through the roof. It's way off the graph there at this point. So it's, um, I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind when we're looking at a generation that is coming of age in this particular environment, in this particular historical location, if you can call it that. I'd like to put this one up here that, um, you know, uh, young people have always kind of worked towards the same goal in the sense that they're trying to find meaning in their existence. They're trying to make sense out of the world. And, and in sometimes more than others, they, they tend to find that, well, maybe this was all a scam. Maybe, maybe this isn't the way I thought it was. Maybe there is something that needs to be changed here. And then again, you know, young people are very often the ones that are introducing those new changes to our world. There is one cycle, though, that does not seem to take uh, have an end in sight or seem not to be plateauing yet, and that is information. It's all the information that exists out uh, in, 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 in the world, all the zettabytes of data. And if we were to really look at a difference between generations, I think this, this is the first generation that is actually born with this amount of information available to them. Uh, very often, the question that I get asked most uh, when I go out to talk to brands or, or marketers uh, about this generation, they ask me, why, why do they have such a short attention span? You know, how can we create marketing campaigns to a generation that really pays attention for five seconds? What's wrong with these guys? And I'm telling them, There's just so much content. There's so much information that this generation has to deal with on a daily basis. If, you're, if your um, phone lights up every five seconds, then obviously you're, you're going to be interrupted because there's a new message or there's a new, there's a new meme or there's, there's constantly something new that you uh, should, should weigh in on or have an opinion on or, or consider. Then obviously that is going to play a part as well. And we can kind of see it when how we process information in the in an age in an age of COVID, uh, that uh, the the younger generations they they use far more sources for for their information. They're getting they're they're using many different technologies and different sources. You can't really see it here, but this is a really good uh, uh, arrow graph. So all these are arrows that 
uh, or, or pie, uh, pie graphs uh, that uh, pie charts that are showing kind of the, the various um, media uh, where, where people are getting their information about COVID. And so you see boomers here, you know, typical top down, typical one way uh, uh, information, typically from, from TV. And then you go down all the way down to mill millennials are probably the most well-rounded in their sources and how they get their information. And then uh, with Gen Z, obviously, there's a lot more use of um, uh, uh, social media and videos, not so much reading or, or watch, watching videos. Um, so uh, so, so it, it can be tempting then to think that, well, this generation is so used to living on the internet anyway. Uh, so do they even care? I mean, th is there even a loss? Is it a sacrifice? This social distancing that we now have done for the last three months or so, uh, isn't that just how they live? And there, there are some studies that can kind of lend substantiation to that, that, you know, if you compare this cohort of youth with, uh, the, 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 young people just you know one generation ago or even two generations ago they used to hang out in, in groups they used to go to the mall they used to go to parties they used to drive around uh and this generation hasn't really shown a whole lot of interest in that comparatively uh, comparative to this other generation i mean this is one of the reasons that the shopping malls are struggling these days so i do think that if there is a generation that can handle this I would say it's probably Generation Z. They they are the ones that are the best equipped to handle uh, social distancing. But I would be amiss uh, to say that this is uh, a, something that they prefer. If this if, if we said that this is something that they can handle without any personal sacrifice, then that would be wrong. It would be a huge misunderstanding of what this uh, the generation really, um, really wants. Uh, as a matter of fact, in most surveys, uh, you'll find that uh, Gen Zers are more likely to appreciate face-to-face -face communication than than even millennials. Uh, so, um, so we, we typically we see we see an uptick with. Uh, if you ask uh, uh, different generations what kind of medium do they prefer, most people will say face to face, but Generation Z more so than millennials. Um, so, and, and I think it goes back to being digital native, for, because what what does nativity really mean? It really means having an innate understanding of a culture. I think too often we tend to think that. Being native to a culture means that you are exuberant about it. So we tend to tend to think of digital natives as these uh, kids who want to do everything electronically and don't care about the the analog world. And that is really not the true because truth because they can really assess the the downside of it as much as the upside. So it's more of a very often you find that they have a more balanced view. And we see it even with uh, with learning. Um, it's interesting that just a few years ago, there was a wild speculation that college would move completely online. You know, we had these MOOCs coming out. We had these online learning modalities, and especially in uh, with with tuition hikes, um, uh, we, we we thought that well, maybe maybe digital um, education is the way to go. Maybe they they won't go to a com college campus anymore. And that is not the truth. Now that that is what they have to do, because we don't even know if the college campuses or how many college campuses are even going to be able to to reopen in the fall. And if they do, might they go down to another shutdown if there's a second wave? And typically what we see with younger generations is that a lot of times they would actually prefer a gap year. They, would, they, they might consider doing a gap year instead of going completely online. Even in light of the fact that it might be easier to uh, to get into uh, good colleges in a time where um, where everything is up in the air um, and uh, and those uh, difficult uh, application or uh, difficult enrollments are, are might be there might be some um, ways to ease that up but uh, still again there there we see young people not being so interested in in that ultra
lonely generation. They they uh, record loneliness. This has been written extensively about prior to this crisis, and uh, it has shot up even forty two. In order to so that it's, it's, a, it's a substitute for the thing. Mental health has been a big issue with this generation, uh, and there's been as many explanatory variables as there are professors who are chasing the favorite uh, theory. Um, for a while, screen, uh, screens were blamed for it. Now it's social media is being blamed for it. Uh, the fact that uh, the message this generation is picking up that the, the climate might might um, go uh, or, or the, the planet might be unhabitable during their lifetime and that obviously has an, has an effect as well. Uh, so they're dealing with record levels of mental stress uh, and this cr crisis that we're going through now is just adding to that. But the interesting part is that we see it typically more in uh, women and we see it uh, in uh, minorities and we see it in young people. So this is not necessarily correlating with who is the most susceptible to, uh, to the, the virus itself. It's more the ones who might have suffered more of the economic consequences of the virus. We know, for example, that if you graduate uh, during a recession, uh, you will likely never catch up financially from those losses, uh, the, the losses that that is associated with. Uh, and we see it already now with the huge layoffs. The people who have been laid off are typically young uh, and they are typically working in uh, jobs that are associated with uh, either a higher risk of being, um, uh, of catching uh, COVID-19 virus Um, or be laid off because of that risk. So some data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and try to categorize it based on whether it's a job that you actually can do at home, uh, if it's a, a job that if you do it in, in another environment than in your home environment, are you having relatively low risk of meeting other people and to the extent that you actually meet a lot of people and the, the, the nature of your job is to be uh, in, in groups with many people. Uh, and then you can typically see that there is a, a age difference there. So the young people are the ones that are being affected the most. So what are they doing? What, how are young people trying to cope with this? Well, they're trying to seek humor. 72% of Gen Zers are trying to look for humorous memes and content. And I, I think that there's a lot of gallows humor there. There's a lot of, even some Scott and Freud maybe. <laughs> um, and uh, and they, uh, uh, they, they use social media to express how they feel. Um, if you run sentiment analysis on a lot of these topics that are trending, you see a lot of emotions being expressed. Uh, mostly negative emotions because the what we are going through at the moment at the moment is there's not too much fun <laughs> there's not too too much good news at the time I'm afraid and they go to social media um, and that's where they spend a lot of their time and it is true that there is some association between um, excessive amounts of social media and and these mental health issues there's there's been some some correlation there it's just uh, it doesn't explain everything as is what i would think now i think it's interesting more to look at the nature in which young people are using social media because there is a difference between how young people are using it and how older people are using it so they, they're not on facebook as i think most people <laughs> have, have caught up uh, if you have a you know, a young relative and they befriend you on Facebook, that, that's not necessarily because they think that's a heap place to be. It's more like meeting up for the family reunion. It's more kind of like, a, okay, I'll show my face here just so that you can know that I'm alive, but it's not their preferred medium. Um, I think the difference between older people on social media and younger people on social media is that Older people don't necessarily know that they're being manipulated always, that there is an algorithm that kind of curates the contents that, that you see. Well, 
uh, younger people are actually harnessing that feature. So they're, they're, they know that there are algorithms that are working in the background and, and dragging them down these different silos and these different rabbit holes. But what they will do is that they will actually actively manipulate these this, this algorithms to, to get into the right channel, if you can call it that. So there's a difference between uh, straight TikTok and uh, alternative TikTok, for example. So if you're on straight TikTok, it's kind of like, that's the lame, that's just the hype house dances. And it's not really, that's not where the, the cool kids want to be. So the cool kids want to go down the rabbit hole and they want to, they want to get the real content. They want to get the juicy part. Uh, and so they know how to, to curate this, to set up filters and to, to, to use the algorithms to, to help them find the content that they want. Uh, for a few years ago, you know, you had, Instagram and or Finstagram and Rinstagram, you know, and I think maybe I don't know if that's a thing yet, but or, or, or any longer, but it used to be that you had an official Instagram account, which was sort of your glamorized self and the way you wanted to project project yourself to the world. And then you had another Instagram account where you could sort of be yourself and you can connect with a fewer, a more limited uh, group of people where you can you didn't have to, to have those that glamorous front necessarily and that is a that's a generational difference you don't see people over 60 doing that this is mostly young people doing that so you know what is the consequences of that you, you know it's um on the one hand you know uh you know the algorithm you know how it works yeah you you, you kind of you're part of the game you're playing that game yourself um and uh, it is probably healthier to to be aware that you know there are algorithms that are trying to shape you or trying to, to, to show you only the content that they think you want. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's like, it, it, it's, um, it really does um, create those silos. It reinforces those silos. Whether you're aware of it or not, you, you are going down these different rabbit holes where it can be very difficult to come, come up from. And, uh, and I think that this is being reinforced in a time when we don't see people when we don't come out in our physical communities because there is there are some controls just being out and seeing people who are different from yourself and being in that that serendipity of being around other people that are that think differently and are different from you it kind of acts as a, a corrective and i'm a little bit afraid of the fact that we're having we having these this this social distancing Exper that big social experiment called social distancing in a time where we're falling into these traps. So on the one hand, it's good because you get more information and there's like there's people out there able to actually record what's really going on in the street. This is imagery that my generation had no clue. You know, we didn't we didn't get this on our phones. We didn't see it. And now this is all they see. So it's kind of in a way, you know, you're, it's good because you're getting more informed, but too much information can be, you know, can be too much of a good thing. Um, and, uh, and you can even possibly create these echo chambers or really reinforce these echo chambers where you can even express an alternative opinion. I'm a little bit worried about this because there, there is a tendency to create these, these clicks and I, a little bit of the, Anecdotal um, examples that I've picked up lately is that you know there's a tendency of shaming that now you know you don't you don't want to be on the wrong side otherwise you're going to be shamed it's almost like you know um, we're, we're back to that the tribal warfare again um, and, or you're going to be blocked or you're going to be on unfollowed and I, I I'm a little bit afraid of young people losing the ability to have uncomfortable discussions uh, enter arenas where people are different and they think different and 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 meeting that with conversation um, instead of um, instead of uh, feeling that you need to to block it out so Jonathan Haidt is a professor at uh, NYU I don't always agree with him I think that he blames social media too much on on why young people are having mental problems um, but what he's finding out is that what we're doing with young people now is that we're not giving them the training it is to 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 learn 
whole conversations where we're, we're reinforcing these these echo chambers essentially. And uh, and and again, I think it's because when you are growing up with the world literally on your fingertips, it's it's a different way of building your tribe. It's a different way of of building your your community because. In most of human history, we have built our communities by proximity to other people, like our, our families or, or our villages or our schools. And with, with sometimes with culture variables like, um, you know, uh, being in a particular income group or, or even, I hate to say, but even, you know, the way we look, given, you know, the fact that we, are, we, we come from different uh, genetic uh, Makeup. So in a way, it's good that um, the younger generations are able to break with that because they're able to create connections across this. They're able to completely traverse these these path these these kind of parameters that we've set up for so many years and connect with someone who is completely you know in in completely different part of the world. If they play Minecraft with you, who cares where they are? Who cares? In, you know what what group they belong to, uh, if they like to dance the same dance on TikTok. Um, so this is really really good in one sense, but on the other hand, we are starting to create tribalism, or we started to create communities based on this idea that we share maybe the same hashtag or the same opinion or the same. Um, um, outlook on things. So what we get is that we get huge diversity, we're, we're creating more and more diversity, but less diversity of opinion. And that can be a little bit dangerous, I think. Um, so how can we see more, seek more common ground? Like how can we create those communities where we encounter different opinions, where young people can learn to have dialogues, when they can learn discussions, um, I think maybe by go going fully immersive, uh, especially if we're not going to be able to have the physical spaces anymore or we have to go to these periodic lockdowns, uh, we might want to really um, use this fully, these haptic feedback suits and, and VR uh, equipment so that you can really um, recreate some of the experiences that other people might have and then and build empathy and understanding that way. Uh, I think one of the reasons that young people are drawn to video is not only because they're lazy and don't want to read, but I think it's because it is a more gratifying type of media. You you can pick up far more uh, nonverbal cues that way, which you can't do in a, in a Facebook comment, for example. Uh, and this would be the extension of that. So that would be one way of, of building or enhancing the way that we communicate. Uh, I also think that you know the tech community itself has, can do a lot. Uh, I disagree with a lot of people who say our oh, algorithms are, are 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 by its own nature um, putting us apart or, or 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 divisive. It's not the machine learning algorithms that are divisive. It's the way that they're optimized. So if you have a target function which is let's try to pigeonhole people as much as possible so that we can pull them down the, these different channels and send it, sell a product to them at the end. Yeah, that's, that's what you get. But if the objective function is to actually look for diversity, to look for people and create communities across uh, and try to find, uh, find ways to, com to, to combine people with very different views, and that's fully possible to do with machine learning. There's nothing that stops us from doing that. I think of uh, uh, adversarial networks, that's exactly how they work. They, they work by, uh, you have two different neural networks that basically uh, makes uh, each, each one making the other one better by, 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 through adversity, through um, iteration of, of um, processes that are uh, contrary. Uh, and I really think that through fostering uh, anthropogility or resilience and democracy, and these are values, these are not only values, but they're actually uh, skills that are in decline, um, which is almost counterintuitive. But if you look at a lot of uh, 
uh, statistics, you, you'll, you'll see, you, you can find a lot of support for that, that democratic discourse and um, uh, different measures of resilience is, is actually in decline. And I think so by trying to focus more on those, those areas, I think we can come a long way and uh, create more and both uh, better communication internally in the younger generations and also across uh, generations. So this is all I had. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, I'm sorry if it was a little disjointed, but I, I look forward to any questions or any comments and, um, and, and hear what you guys think about this. Hello, Faye here. I have one silly question. Have you seen the anime called Sword Art Online? The what? The anime called Sword Art Online? I haven't. Okay, so basically the premise of the story is it's a virtual multiplayer online where it's a full dive system, kind of like the Tesla suit, and the characters get trapped in there for a couple of years until they can beat the game. Mm -hmm. I think that would be crazy if that technology came to fruit and fruition. But on the other hand, I think if we did have full dive technology, it would be useful to be able to communicate with people across borders. Yeah. Sounds very interesting. I would really like to check that out. Yep. I wish you good luck going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, any any examples like that? I'm very uh, uh, interested in that. I, I, I don't have a Tesla suit. I think that the Tesla suit would, would need to come down the price curve quite a, quite a bit before it really hits the mainstream. Um, but I, you know, that's typically what happens to technology. So I wonder if that is, might be uh, in the future. Yeah, yeah, who knows? Maybe it will be in the future or maybe not. It may be replaced by holodecks from Star Trek or something like that. Who knows? We're yeah. at the crossroads. <laughs> Uh, Anne, could you uh, speak more to the, uh, the perception and reaction, Gen Z, to uh, to climate change issues? Mm, thank you for asking me that. Yes, um, you know what's interesting uh, is to look at young uh, Republicans. There's not many of them. But that's where you see the biggest change. Like if you compare. Uh, young left leaning, and they tend to be left leaning, you know, with older left leaning, then you don't, you know, that's not where you have the biggest change. But you really have it among young conservative people. And you really see that that's an area that where they are fully on board with, um, but you see more consensus between the political factions, especially now that it's so polarized politically, you don't see polarity in that view. Um, I, I very, very rarely do I find examples, even anecdotally, of young people who are not terrified of that development. And I, I actually, in the, um, in the context of mental health, I think it's an area that has not been uh, explored near enough. As a matter of fact, I would love to do some multilateral research there and really get the various causes of what is causing deep anxiety in the population. And I think that climate change and or the whole conundrum, you know, the, the, everything from species extinction to climate change to pollution and that whole gambit, I think, is, uh, is a huge elephant in the room. And I guess I'd like to maybe build on Tal's question there a little bit. And um, do you know offhand Gen Z's thoughts on all the telework we've been seeing because of COVID, I would imagine they'd be pretty supportive from a climate change perspective. Yes, that's interesting. And you know, that is exactly the kind of data that I wish that I had. And I wish that there were like uh, some uh, polling institute, institutes that would have, you know, uh, had, had their wherewithal already to ask some questions there. Um, I don't have data on it. If there, if that is a discourse, if that is a thought that is now being projected, but one thing that I, I know is that there is there there has been some um, um, 
interest in looking for silver linings in this generation um, with COVID and that one of those silver linings might exactly be that, that we're, we're polluting a lot less. So what I think would be interesting to see is, do we really want to go back to normal? Like, is that even a fair, is that, some, is that even fair? Is it even something they would consider doing? Because I don't think so. I, I think that that could be a, sort of a bargaining tool in the future uh, where, where they would say, hey, you were willing to do all this for, for a virus that kills older people, but you're not willing to do this for us. You know? Mm, yeah, I can see that. Definitely. Um, so I guess, um, I mean, you know, this would be an interesting question because you talk about like, um, you know, that just unfortunately there, there's not a lot of data that's been obtained yet. Um, for mm -hmm. a futurist studying generations in an online space, what yeah. are some of the main ways to get that data? Uh, I So I think surveys is, uh, I, I'm a big fan of both surveys and uh, of, uh, sorry, I just had to put in my power cord. I thought I had enough uh, power and I didn't. Um, so I think all, that, all here, no <laughs> <laughs> it's like this new Zoom lifestyle, you know. Um, so I, um, I, I think you can get both structured data through surveys. Uh, it's the way that you ask the questions. If you just ask, do you care about climate change? They're going to say yes. If you ask questions like, if you have a situation like this, uh, there's this sacrifice here, but you have this gain here like pros and cons, then I think you can get good data. And you compare different generations. You don't just ask one generation, but you ask several, then you can get some, some interesting data there. Um, I also think that you can get it from, like I like to do uh, a lot of uh, just look at what people say uh, in social media. I think most people are fairly honest. They bring their emotions, like you could see from those sentiment graphs that I put up there that people will express themselves in social media and what they're really think that they wouldn't necessarily do to a pollster. I think you can even get it from Google searches. Like if you if you're able to look at, you know, who and we don't have that data, but if you're able to see, for example, where do people sit when they search for something, what what are people searching for now versus what did they search for like six months ago? Um, I think that you can find sentiments there. So it's a uh, yeah, I think there's a very different, various sources that you can get data about this generation. Uh, have you seen any difference with how uh, baby boomers and Gen X view uh, you know, Gen Z versus how they viewed millennials? How they view millennials? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, well, so the difference hard. between, yeah, how they... <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Sorry, um, you can... Sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, millennial, and I, I'm just kidding. Um, so it's funny. Uh, anecdotally, again, you know, sometimes I have one thing I have data for, and the other thing I have only, or one thing I have representative data, and then I also have some anecdotes. So representative data, they, millennials is the generation that uh, uh, Gen Zers are um, relating to the most, which is probably understandable. They're closer in age. Um, and they tend to overlap on a lot of issues. Uh, Gen Zers are very similar to millennials uh, on, on many issues. They just tend to have a little bit more pessimistic outlook on things. They're a little bit more rough around the edges, maybe. They love to make fun of millennials. Like, this is, this is where the anecdotes come in. Uh, like, BuzzFeed, like, the, <laughs> like the, you know, BuzzFeed is a very millennial thing. And uh, I, I don't necessarily understand Gen Zers, what they find funny, but they that it it goes it's mostly that um, where if they if there's a divergence. So you see, I talked to a lot of Gen Zers who who tell me that oh, millennial humor is so lame because they're so old, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, so my question was more about how do boomers and Gen X view uh, Gen Z as compared to how they viewed. Uh, millennials. So it's, it's oh, more from yeah. the perspective of, yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah. So 
I think uh, Gen Xers, uh, this is wild speculation, by the way, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of data for this, but you know, I, I, I pick up sentiments as I read texts that may touch on these issues. Um, my sense is that Gen Xers uh, have a much closer relationship to Gen Z because it's their children, most of them. Uh, it tends to skip a generation. You know, uh, most people don't get kids when they're 20. And, you know, if there's like 15 or 20 years between between generations, then uh, you typically get your kid, first kid when you're maybe, you know, 20, 29, maybe in your 30s. Uh, Gen Xers kids are uh, Gen Z. And we're a little bit too close to Gen Xers. So there's a little bit of that sibling rivalry. And Gen Xers are really tired of millennials uh, taking up all the space. <laughs> you know, you see this me, these posts where Generation X is invisible uh, and millennials are everywhere. <laughs> um, so I th that's kind of the sense, the general sense that I get. I think boomers. Um, so boomers and millennials have always had that fighting going on, eternal struggle. But it's really Gen Zers that are calling out the boomers the most. They're they're the most vicious. They can be fairly vicious with boomers, to be honest. And it's like, gosh, you guys need to stop. I remember right when COVID came out, there was a hashtag going around called Boomer Remover. Like they called the virus Boomer Remover. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, wow, <laughs> and it, I, I just, I, oh God, and I, I was really worried for a while because I thought, well, if that's how they view it, are they not going to be careful enough? Are they going to uh, just, you know, do they have this mentality that it doesn't matter because it happens only to older people and, you know, lame older boomers, so we don't care. So I was really worried about that for a while, but I think it was mostly... It was it was a dark joke again. You know, there, there's a lot of gallows humor. Humor tends to be a little bit dark. So as a as a uh, Gen Xer, I've got a question about uh, then how to communicate with um, the younger ones. So I remember I don't want to just try and uh, adopt the language because that would be like an old person in the '60s trying to take on the new slang and I'll just sound stupid. So I think it's too late for me to just try to be cool on Instagram or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, but what, uh, what are the good tools that I should use? Are there any different new things that older people like me in my 40s or 50s should be doing with to connect with my teenage and 20-something nephews? Yeah. Empathize deeply. I, I think that's really, I mean, they're screaming for empathy. Uh, and that's really an, an understanding. Uh, they are seeing their perception of the world now is that, uh, first of all, older people have made them the, you know, the ones that are going to have to deal with this. And they, they almost joke about it. You know, older people almost joking about like, you know, oh, gosh, you guys are going to have to fix the world after we're gone. Uh, yeah, thank you. You know, so that's I think a lot of them feel that and they don't even feel that they're given the the tools. They feel that they have been left a world in shambles. So, yeah, I think it's much better to just have really deep, empathetic conversations than trying to be cool and all of that. Um I actually, I culturally appropriate my children's culture only because I like it. And I, I, try, I even ask them sometimes, like, is it okay that I listen to the music that you guys listen to? Do you think that I'm old and lame? And they, they, they're okay with it. Um, so I, you know, um, I think, again, I think it's just really not being out of tune. I think if, if, uh, if older people are, in tune with what they want and what they need, um, the, their deepest need, and they don't ask. They don't ask for much. They actually go to thrift stores. They don't. They don't buy expensive stuff. They're not interested in that. But they're they care very deeply about the state of the planet and and racial racial justice and uh, and things of that matter. Thank you for answering my question earlier. Yeah, thank you too. Sorry, that was a little. <laughs> Did you 
speak a little bit more about the uh, generation and civic engagement? You just mentioned that they're more interested in those type of issues, but how they engage with the civic uh, landscape is of interest. Uh, I, I personally seem to see uh, definitely an increase in that over the previous generation. Yeah. Uh, wondering if you have any other observations about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think activism is uh, is one of the defining traits. I think if we went into a time machine and we go, you know, 30 years into the future, we will definitely look at this generation as a as an activist generation, one that really wants to to make big changes. Uh, and again, I think this was literally the litmus test or the virus test, you know, because you go out there and you protest now, you actually risk uh, getting a potentially deadly virus. So the fact that, and not only that, but you 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 risk getting tear gas and possibly pushed down. Or, so I think that the risks that many young people have been taking um, and that they haven't only done this in social media, for a long time, there was a lot of, complaint that people are not activists anymore. They're not going out, they're not protesting, they're not making the real changes because they're just posting something on social media. And I think we've seen that that's not the case. They are really, really active. One other question is uh, how much population size the birth rate affects each of the generations? Yeah, you know, uh, so actually we, I have some statistics that show me that uh, he, I'm not from a, uh, the U.S. myself. Uh, I'm from uh, Norway uh, and we have not really had the same kind of demographic trends. But uh, my statistics is showing me that one of the reasons that millennials were such a big generation is not necessarily because it, it's not because boomers was a big generation. So when they had kids, naturally millennials became a bigger generation, but it's also because of immigration and because immigrants traditionally have had more children than uh, uh, those who are born here. That stopped in 2007. It's only been a decline, a steep decline. Uh, and we are not caught up. We're way under uh, reproductive uh, the reproductive limit or rate. Um, so um, the replacement level. Yeah, replacement. Sorry, thank you for <laughs> refreshing my mind. Um, and so um, yeah, I, I I don't the the the, com the combined facts that Jen. Zers are the children of Gen Xers, which in general is a smaller generation, combined with uh, fewer immigrants and the fact that the immigrants that are here are having fewer children. Um, that has an, a, an effect. Of course, millennials is a larger generation, but they are not having a lot of children. So I don't know. I really don't know if uh, we're going to ever get above it again. So as we look at these demographics mm -hmm. and the uh, big events coming up this fall in the elections, are the Gen Z kids that are ready to or able to vote, are they going to show up? Um, they really just want it. They, they don't trust the system. So it's a dilemma because on the one hand, they don't. They certainly want a different leadership. That's that's obvious. But there are so many of them that really don't believe in demographic, I mean, democratic processes anymore. Uh, there's so many of them that just want actually a revolution, um, so that they don't even trust that the the system is working. So they might, many of them might not even want to make the sacrifice that it is to go and and vote because they don't trust the system at all. I think institutional trust uh, among that generation, trust in government is around 10% or something. So it's it's hard to say, and especially the uh, candidates that the, Democrat, uh, the Democrats have chosen to be their presidential candidate is 
one that they just can't get excited about. And I think that was the biggest problem with um, uh, Bernie at not running. I think that if Bernie Sanders had been running for president, uh, I would probably say that they would try to give the system a chance. But there's so many in this, this generation that, to begin with, they don't trust the system to begin with. So they might, they might not show up. When you say they want a revolution, are you saying that they want to restore uh, what they believe is a proper democratic system or a republic, or that they don't want that either? Good question. Um, I don't have data to say uh, one or the other. The, the data that I do have is that on, if you're familiar with the World ba uh, Value Survey, you've seen that the, the various uh, questions that, that are designed to assess whether democratic, like traditional democratic functions are important to you, that's kind of going down with each generation. So if you, I think the latest data is only millennials, but I have some other supplementing data to indicate that those values are not as important for this generation as it is for older generations. For example, what I mentioned. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, no, I sorry. I didn't quite understand. So are you saying that that's the case for the U.S. or Western countries? Or are you saying that for the entire world? Because if you look at the entire world, you have an, an, a population that's online that used to not be online that doesn't live in democracies. Absolutely. No, I, this is not for the entire world. Uh, this is the, the stats that I have seen on this have been from mostly Western democracies. So the 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 established countries, the ones that have been demo uh, democracies for a long time uh, and have sort of forgotten, uh, they're kind of taking it for granted. Um, uh, I think, for example, if you were to hold the generation that lived through World War II, you will sense that there's a very strong sense of, of wanting to protect democracy, free speech, democracy type of issues. Um, because they have that experience. And again, you know, what is with Mark Twain is that, is that, you know, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So if you have had a generation that experienced one historic phenomena and the next, the following generations have not been through the same, they are not going to put the same emphasis. That doesn't mean that they're against it. It doesn't mean that, you know, they uphold fascism or, or, uh, or, or more authoritarian regimes it just means that they have less enthusiasm around those principles basically yes, thank you very much sort of potentially springboarding on that um and i know that uh, last time we had you speak i know i talked some on these topics um and i'd be remiss given where eff austin i'll not ask you again if you know, I don't remember what your answer was last time. I have to go check the video. But, you know, I'm I'm curious about Gen Z's evolving attitudes around privacy and digital spaces. Like, I'm pretty sure the last time we had you talk, TikTok was kind of a brand new thing. And it's kind of come out in the last few years that there's major concerns about uh, who is watching people on TikTok, but potentially associated groups of uh, the Communist Party of China. And, you know, you mentioned that Gen Z actually has kind of a savvy awareness that they're being manipulated in these digital spaces. I'm curious what they think about, like, that they're using this app that is so heavily surveilling them with a uh, foreign government that even if you don't necessarily uh, subscribe to China hysteria, you might think doesn't necessarily have the best intentions of what they're going to do with this data. So I'm just curious, what does Gen Z think about stuff like that? Yeah, good question. No, they're, uh, they do actually tend to uh, delete, I forget what it's called, but there's, um, if you have a draft in, in TikTok, there's been rumors that that gets data mined. So if you have something post, uh, that gets data mined and that the, the, that the government, the Chinese government is, is data mining that. Um, so yeah, they they are very much they they like to call out their digital footprints. They like to delete it. They like they don't like to have lingering posts. They always go back. They delete stuff. They're more into the more about stories that kind of self destruct after a while than than stuff to be around. They're not trying to build like a an online uh, photo album or anything like that. So definitely, um, 
I I don't know to which extent the fact that China, the chi- the communist government of China, uh, if they see that as far worse than uh, the government that they're living under here in their minds, I think that they kind of uh, they, they don't really see the difference as much. Um, so I think it's more more a general discourse, uh, a general concern whether they are, uh, you know, interested in, in in protecting their digital footprints uh, more than which countries having access to that data. Um, I could be wrong here. I haven't really done a study on it, but uh, but but that, that's the sense that I'm getting. However, one thing that they are voicing is that they do like this. I told you about the straight TikTok. Uh, they feel that the Chinese government is um, actively trying to um, portray certain types of posts versus others. Like, so for example, Black Lives Matter, they feel like that is a thread that gets um, censored more. They believe that black creators are being censored more. Again, I don't have the data myself, but this is this is a pretty... Um, common sentiment among young people who are on TikTok, um, that that is a problem with TikTok. And this that is probably going to be, if, if that is true and that comes out, then I think TikTok is going to have a huge PR problem with this generation uh, because that's, that's not kosher, obviously. Um, but yeah, again, also there's something, they, uh, they believe that uh, TikTok is actively promoting posts that uh, trigger body dysmorphia, for example. And that's, that's one of those awareness issues that they have. Uh, YouTube was kind of the opposite because on YouTube, there was a lot of body positivity. There was a lot of alternative voices. So there were, it kind of expanded the horizon and expanded the, um, uh, the, the type of protagonists that you see and the type of creators that you see, whereas uh, TikTok is kind of drastically limiting it. And that's that's the sentiment that I pick up with the young users. Ooh. What was that term? His body what was it dysmorphia? I'm sorry? Uh, what was the term that you used? Uh, body yeah. dysmorphia? Yes, yeah, so, so body dysmorphia is pretty much like a fancy way of talk, uh, saying that people get overly concerned about the, the, how they their body look, what their body looks like. And so if you feature just a certain type of, you know, blonde, skinny, thin waist girls who are dancing and sexualizing themselves, that, um, that can give... Uh, problems, you know, young girls, uh, and that there has been some findings there that a lot of young young uh, users uh, on uh, TikTok, or social media in general, are are developing uh, things like anorexia, bulimia, and not only young girls but men too, young young men as well. And so, if TikTok is actively promoting these videos and making sure that that comes in in your the for you pages uh, more often then that can have a you know negative effect on this generation and also how they perceive the medium itself cool. all right thank you sure is there anybody we haven't heard from yet who has a question for Anne? i had a question related to the humor i thought that was an interesting observation do you see other kind of general uh general stereotypes maybe of humor across certain generations and gen z humor gen x humor you know on through the different generations yeah yes definitely uh in terms of humor (laughs) um yes absolutely there's a lot of uh boomer memes obviously it's um Actually, uh, young people think it's very funny uh, the way that a lot of older people are using Facebook and what they put out there. Uh, there are, you know, threads about that. You can read articles and you can see screenshots of, um, you know, f- funny posts that are in posts, and they they don't understand internet etiquette or etiquette. They don't they don't they just don't get it. And so so there's a lot of humor around that. Of course, the the other the the reverse humor is that young people are just snowflakes and they they can't do anything. They don't know how to live in the real world. Um, 
and uh, they're, they're, they'll succumb to any little, you know, physical power uh, that is not involving screens. So you have those tropes and those uh, stereotypes and, you know, the Tide Pods and the, and the avocado toast and all of that. But then there's also a lot of myths that just get to live on their own, uh, which is very interesting. And th these go both way too. Um, for example, th there's a lot of ageism I've noticed uh, in, for example, in, in tech. Um, so I've been working in, in, in tech for a while and uh, so I'm kind of sensing a little uh -huh. bit of the sentiment here. And there's, there's a strong sentiment that older people don't know how to use technology, which is kind of interesting because when we had to operate, you know, we were, or no, I'm, I'm not a boomer, but I'm old enough to remember having, you know, having to use command language to operate a computer before graphical interfaces. So it's kind of a little bit ironic that younger people are, are saying that older people don't know how to use technology because that's not really true. The, the way that young people excel in using technology is in the uh, more so, sort of like the technology culture. So they know how to use it culturally. They know how to, to harness the, 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 you know, the medium itself. It's, uh, was it, um, yeah, I'm blanking uh, on everybody. Who, who said that the medium is the message? McLuhan, right? So, it, yeah, so they know how to use the medium. They know how to use these uh, digital technology as a medium, but it's not that they're necessarily more technological. Same thing I hear with uh, being uh, innovative. For some reason, we've gotten this, idea that the the best entrepreneurial businesses are created by 20 year olds who are sitting in their dorm rooms and that's not true that's simply not true the stats are showing that the most successful and the most on the the most entrepreneurial and the most successful businesses are started by people in their late 40s so you know, so I think that there's a lot of myths, and some of those myths play over into into funny moments and humor. Okay. Got any more questions? Uh, it's fine if you've already asked a question. Um, feel free to ask some more. I. Might have one or two more I can uh, think of or I'm curious about if nobody else has any others. Let me think, what would be a good one? Um, so, um, and you, you've talked quite a bit about, um, you know, Gen Z's, you know, need for social connection and that they've been struggling about this a great deal as a generation and then the covid crisis paradoxy has made this even worse for them it seems even though you might think they'd be the most equipped to connect uh, digitally um i'm curious what is there any data that bears out how gen z mm -hmm. is really spending this crisis i mean i know my generation's pretty much an in with zoom meetings as is gen x um i'm wondering like where is Gen Z spending its time stuck home alone and not even in school right now? And um, is there market differences in where they're spending their time in digital spaces versus millennials or Gen X? Um, again, I think if you go back to that slide that shows where they're getting their information from, I think they're pretty much where they have always been and that is using social media, especially um, I think social media is more important now than it has been, in a, you know, even more than it was before. Um, and, you know, FaceTime, Zoom, all of these different electronic platforms that let you have face to face, you know, as, as good as possible, you know, even if it's not physically. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, you know, there's some other interesting findings that I see as well. And, you know, there's there's these new trends where uh, people are becoming interested in baking things, right? So you see a lot of content on TikTok these days. It's like different, new different type of recipes where they're creating new type of cookies or all kind of things. And then there's uh, people who are creating their home gardens now. So even young people are becoming interested in growing their own food. Um, I see, um, 
I saw, I see a lot of creativity um, and, and, and that being an increase in these sort of like DIY type of sharing videos, which is pretty natural when you're home all the time and you can't go anywhere, you might want to create things. Um, and I see, you know, it's interesting if you go outside in the neighborhood, try to pay attention to all the kids that are making these um, uh, chalk drawings, you know, on the sidewalks and everywhere. Suddenly, you know, that was one of the first things I noticed after the, the school start stopped uh, having kids in them is that the kids were home and they were out with chalk. So the silver lining, one silver lining here is probably that we were learning to to, to start making things again. We're learning to do the things that we used to do before we got all stressed out with schools and uh, after school curricula and all of that stuff. Very interesting. Well, let's uh, see. I may be running dry on my thoughts myself. Um, and, you know, we have the room technically, not like in the past where we had to be out by noon, we technically have it uh, as long as we want. But also, I don't believe in dragging meetings out longer than uh, the participants have questions. So I may go ahead and call us a bit early here unless uh, somebody has not spoken or would like to get one more question in for Anne here before we adjourn. I want to thank everybody for the questions. It's uh, been a very interesting discussion. And um, I always, uh, Appreciate all of you in these crazy times to make the time to uh, join us here. I know it's uh, easy to get zoomed out, as they say. So I uh, really appreciate you all for uh, caring about being part of our community and being passionate about these issues. Um, yeah, so since it seems like we're probably out of questions, I'll just say I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us, and uh, we always love having you. And I'm uh, sure we'll probably over the years continue to periodically check in with you as there are new uh, developments. Uh, with generations and their use of technology. Oh, uh, Tal, do you have a question? Oh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate thank having you and your support. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you, Anne. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Enjoyed it. We really appreciate all your support, and we uh, we hope you'll see we'll see you guys next month. And I'll just reiterate one last time: uh, make sure you vote. Uh, it's it's very important, even with a pandemic. Um, it's very important. So uh, you care about these issues, get out there and uh, try to make a difference. Because I think, as we've actually seen recently from these protests, those of us in the digital civil liberty space are used to despairing on these issues. We passionately try to get the Patriot Act reformed, and then we see both major parties reauthorizing it anyway, which really can lead to a lot of cynicism on our part, rightfully. But as we've seen recently from these protests, um, in collective action, we can get the rigged two-party system on a lot of these issues to actually cave to our demands and make real change. We're seeing incredible real change in cities across this country in just a few weeks. So I would encourage the digital civil liberties community to look to this and the success of this movement and realize that we can succeed in our fight too if we come together and demand the change that we need to see to make sure everybody's privacy and speech are protected as technology goes forward. We literally today saw IBM swear off using facial recognition technology until the social implications can be more fully understood. So I know things feel really dark a lot these days, but I encourage you to stay optimistic and keep fighting. Um, thank you all very much and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you, Kevin. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.